I find that tutoring is is one of a few ways to kind of save yourself as a learner, whether you're experiencing the tutor yourself or you're delivering the tutoring. That's a big point in my book is that when a tutor is born, so is a learner. Helping an individual as a learner early on in their life is what is the recipe for genius, in my opinion. I was one of the few students she took aside, took me outside of the classroom and said, Ian, wow, you're mean. You're fundamentally mean. In my experience, tutoring is, is, a, is, is a form of, of education in which the more you invest, the more you get out of it, unlike school, which can be a black hole in terms of you know, investment. Hello and welcome to the Qualified Tutor Podcast, the podcast that brings you the latest in the world of tutoring, edtech and education, and hopefully inspires in you the big change that each and every one of us is capable of. Qualified Tutor is an industry-leading tutor training organisation and online tutoring community for thousands of tutors around the world. This podcast is the voice of this community, where we aim to hear from tutors, teachers, entrepreneurs, coaches, business experts, students, tutorpreneurs, and more from the world of tutoring about what inspires them every day, how they can help tutors like you, and what they've learned about tutoring along the way. The question is, what will you learn today? Hello and welcome to the 122nd episode of the Qualified Tutor Podcast. My name is Ludo Miller, the host of this podcast. Uh, Welcome back to regular listeners. Welcome to any of you for whom this is your first time listening to the Qualified Tutor Podcast. And of course, a huge welcome to today's guest, Ian Siegel. Ian, welcome to the podcast. Ludo, thanks for having me on. I'm so excited to be here. Now, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted today because Ian is uh, someone who comes to the podcast with a great deal of experience in the tutoring industry um, and was connected to Qualified Tutor and to me uh, recently. And, and, and it's been uh, great to get to know Ian it, just in this brief time. And I'm sure um, we will be hearing a lot more from him as a community, as the Qualified Tutor community in, in weeks and months and, and years to come. Ian uh, is the founder of uh, Streamline Learning, uh, a US-based uh, tutoring uh, agency, uh, and also has recently written a, a wonderful book um, on the field of obviously tutoring more widely, but also about how we learn. It's such a, um, a key message to qualify tutor and to our community. That book is called The Tutor Bible, Learning to Learn Again, and we will be exploring the the ins and outs of that book uh, and the wider philosophy um, uh, and what that means to Ian uh, over the next 25 minutes or so. Um, But Ian, I want to start with something that we we often start with on this podcast. Um, Now, when I I brought this up with you a a few days ago, you mentioned that while a full school report may not be available, may have got lost in house moves or clearings or whatever it is, you do have uh, a story to tell from your seventh grade. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I was guilty of whenever I got a mark that I wasn't happy with, I would, you know, sometimes I was a terrible student and I would toss my paper because without looking at my teacher's feedback, because I thought, wow, they must have made a mistake. And this story kind of illustrates the same mindset at some level. Um, so I picture me, I guess in the States, we, I had, a, I was in middle school, which I was about um, 13 years old, around there, I guess 12. And I was in science class. Now I, I was generally a, what would be called, what we would call a good student. I just intended to get all, all A's. Um, but I, there was a science project that we were tasked with. And in the States, it's a very kind of methodical uh, uh, approach that you have to take in terms of engaging with the scientific uh, uh, method. You're, you have to have a clear problem, hypothesis, procedure, results all the way to the conclusion. And you, the teacher wanted us to present those parts of the project in very clear order, you know, based on the rubric that we had. So I was 
a curious kid and I, I, you know, felt like I was chasing ideas. So once I found out that plants, you know, use carbon dioxide to, um, you know, to, to, to complete photosynthesis, um, I, I thought, oh, I know what makes carbon dioxide, dry ice. So I created this whole experiment where I'd throw dry ice in some, you know, boxes with plants and, uh, and, and others with, n with none, pretty much all of the plants died. It didn't really work out too well for a variety of reasons, but I've I at least felt like I was like, oh, I feel like I'm learning something, you know? So during the presentation of the project, I felt like a little bit, um, you know, just kind of like, I, I, I could tell from the teacher's eyes that I wasn't quite doing what I was supposed to do according to the rubric. And this wasn't actually just me, but multiple people in my class, there was this kind of feeling of like, mm, something's not quite right. A couple of days later, the teacher tasked us with a, our, our, we would have to, we all had to write letters to our teachers, to our teacher saying kind of what grade we thought we deserved and why. Me being the smart aleck that I was said, look, I think I should get an A for this. But the reality of it, given the, you know, the kind of, anti-creative stance of this school and, and schooling in general, um, I, I think you're gonna give me a B and maybe even a B minus. I got a D on that project. And, <laughs> and, and there, I wasn't the only one. There were multiple Ds in the classroom. Kids who, did, who hadn't gotten um, bad grades before were crying. Um, but, but that was, it was a big lesson. But that, after that point, I was one of the few students she took aside took me outside of the classroom and said, Ian, wow, <laughs> you're mean. <laughs> you're fundamentally mean. I mean, you came at, and I, I said, you know what? I stood my ground. I was like, but I, I really felt like I was trying here. I, can't, I mean, if anything, you proved my point. Um, so, so I, don't, I, I mean, I guess that gives you an example of a, the iconic class that I was before. And I guess saying it out loud, I was, I was thinking, it's like, I really haven't changed that much, at least on that front. <laughs> That's wonderful. I, I I wonder then, Ian, if if do you think then that that informs a little bit about who you are today and and why you do what you do now? Yes, it, I, I think it very much does, actually. Um, I mean, that's just a small anecdote that might illustrate a um, you know a greater reality, which I. And, and, and this, and, and this kind of sounds weird, but I, cause it does, it toots my own horn just a little bit, but I do find consistently through tutoring that the most capable learners tend to be the worst learners. And I, I think that I was trying to be a good learner at that point and I was fighting to do so, but I was but this experience that happens so often in school where it's like you are being indoctrinated into a set of rules um, and, and certain frameworks that are already accepted rather than helping someone kind of engage with the unknown, which is what I was doing, making a fool of myself in some ways. But I, I think that's, that's really my why at the end of the day is really investigating what are the factors that are leading to some of the most capable students trending to being the worst learners over the course of their lives. Not starting that way, being inc incredible learners, but, but I've been paying very close attention using the vacuum of a tutoring session to kind of understand what are actually the variables that count that affects someone's ability to learn and how does it, what's the kind of calculus between someone's environment and their capacities that can create an incredible learner versus someone who's basic, basically stuck and shut down. So how then is someone who is a very capable, intelligent learner, and therefore someone you say is, is can be a bad learner because of the way that they are, that their brain works. How does that play out when that learner becomes an educator like you? How do those people who have become tutors, how does that interplay work between being an, an capable, intelligent learner to being a what kind of educator? So I find that tutoring is, is one of a few 
ways to kind of save yourself as a learner, whether you're experiencing the tutor yourself or you're delivering the tutor. Tutoring, that's a big point in my book, is that that when a tutor is born, so is a learner. And and I find it very consistent that we can find I, I'll my business started off in Baltimore, where we're right next to Johns Hopkins, and we would pull very bright students who are just recently graduated from Hopkins to be kind of our primary staff. But I've consistently found that these students, although incredibly bright, were not good at interacting with the unknown. They were extremely good at proving what they already know. And, and so that kind of shift happens um, without kind of, if, if you're going to do tutoring right, the shift is inevitable because you're finally in this one-on-one -on -one situation where what you don't know is obvious. It becomes incredibly obvious and, and how you're unable to actually um, convey knowledge in a way that you, you know, you're asking questions, thinking from the student's perspective while kind of having mastery over what you need to have mastery over. Like you can get away with that outside of tutoring, but that, that kind of all those pieces of knowledge, deep knowledge of the student, deep knowledge of the subject at hand, it's kind of inescapable um, and, 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 and tutoring holds the very valuable function of helping you integrate, which is what everyone's missing uh, in school is, is school gets you to conscious awareness. Um, but I know I noticed that you went to Oxford and you got to experience the tutorial. And I think that's the missing piece for so many students is that having an expert kind of put you on the spot, ask you a hundred critical thinking questions or getting get you to defend what you think. Um, and, and really using that to neurologically kind of integrate so that it becomes part of you, part of your conscious prediction of the outside world and which fundamentally frames, reframes kind of the possibilities of your life, which is, which is like never actually happens for the vast majority of students. And then they kind of judge themselves within that very narrow framework, which is really unfortunate because it's just like people aren't really changing. And, and just like the institution of school hasn't changed very much, which is to me a really scary idea given how much everything else has changed. I think that topic is, is so important about how, what happens when very bright students, learners, grow up and become adults and become educators and and how they're able to relate to to learners i, I think certainly something that um myself and my my university friends talked about was how we found when some of us went into tutoring we were less able to relate to learners who struggled because it was less likely that in our during our school days we had struggled greatly on on subjects even if we had you know on certain subjects um so i think i think that's an incredibly important topic and, and actually i want you were mentioning your book just there um ian and you know a fantastic book highly highly relevant to our audience um i'd love to to know more to, to tell us why um now is the time you've chosen to to write and release the tutor bible because it was released in uh, just june this year is that right that's right yeah absolutely um well, I think there's there's a it's a two part answer to that question. One is externally, like the environment today, at least in the states, is finally opening up to the possibility of tutoring on a, at a wide scale, and kind of understanding that as a viable possibility. To the to, to the extent that Biden is rolling out this, you know, multi billion dollar, two hundred fifty thousand tutors are going to help change you know, the country, kind of all that, because there's a massive admission in, in, inherent in that plan, which is, this is better. And to me, it's like, I want to kind of go a couple steps further to say like, well, why aren't we doing this all along? We're spending so much money on COVID relief. Like this is what, if we put, you know, in my experience, tutoring is, is, a, is, is a form of, of education in which the more you invest, the more you get out of it, unlike school, which can be a black hole in terms of, you know, investment. I, I think just like if you kind of just look at the study done, you know, a decade ago where it's, where they found that when you adjust for socioeconomic class, 
a student paying for private school versus, you know, public school, that same student, there's no difference in learning outcomes. So, so like putting more money into school doesn't actually make a difference. Um, so what I'm trying to do is really capitalize on this moment to say, hey, well, once you start going down the path of tutoring, it's like the more investment, the better. And not all tutors are created equally, or at least not all tutors have the same level of experience that they can really kind of change a student within that you know, situation. And that the, and the reason is it, it has a lot to do with how both parties, the student and the tutor are coming into the situation as probably p- pretty bad learners. Like that, they, that the tutor, you know, who's new has not mastered things to the extent that they might that they might need to. And the student is a terrible learner because of the expectations that they're constantly judging themselves in or or kind of reacting to. And so that like, we're, it's kind of a bad situation in my opinion, because a lot of people are, are what I would call not in a learning state, but instead in a survival state. And, and in that situation, people are just trying to prove what they already know. And whether it's a teacher, a parent, or a student, and not actually kind of engaging with what they don't know in a healthy way. Uh, So that's my, you know, kind of analysis of the bigger, bigger challenge in, in kind of bringing tutoring in. And so I'm hoping that when people read the tutor Bible, they'll realize kind of what the inherent problems are with school and also realize that there's a certain there's certain aspects of tutoring that are essential that that you have to really kind of ground your uh, instruction in to make tutoring as effective as possible. Yeah, it's an idea we've had, you know, discussed by by several guests about how the very fabric of the education system can be can be reimagined, especially uh, since since lockdown and since the complete um, upheaval in the way that we taught classroom in classrooms i want to ask you in because your book clearly shows it demonstrates an ability to imagine differently in you in what what should education look like to you in in 2022 so I, I think that this is kind of like a Galileo moment in which the, we're kind of wrong. We're focusing on the wrong center of gravity in terms of education and that tutoring could be really the kind of nexus of what we care about as opposed to school as the, as the school kind of, to me, comes later. Um, you, helping a, an individual as a learner early on in their life is what is the recipe for genius in my opinion, because it's like helping you reorient your kind of engagement and with the world at a time when your neurons are changing at a million miles a second. Um, So I feel like we should be shifting the entire education system to be based on tutoring, play, um, group projects, and adaptive technology that that the actual classroom could be more seminar style once students are better versions of themselves as learners but right now i think the kind of the the image in my mind is the the high school classroom at its best which could be an english seminar at a private school where there's 10 kids who have all the resources in the world talking about writing, sharing perspectives, that idealized kind of vision of like what school could be, could be actually real as opposed to a complete fiction because the reality is kids are way too stressed. They're reading spark notes. They're barely reading a page. They're only making reading real insofar as it might sound like an insightful comment to their teacher, never making it real to themselves, doing terribly on the SAT because they haven't had any practice reading in that way. And then, and, and kind of like, and then that's it. You know, I, I think it's just, it's just that we need to restructure it around an honest appraisal about the variables that count in education. And the number one is the student. And we, schools will shy away from looking at cognitive assessments. 
They'll shy away from like engaging with the psychology of the student. But those are top two for me. Most smart kids, they don't need to go to school. They just need to have like brain health and, you know, like have the right psychological orientation toward the world, set them, set them free. Um, otherwise, it's just really oppressive and it, it just creates a kind of strange competitiveness that undermines our own abilities as learners in the first place. I, I'm in awe of the passion here, Ian. The <laughs> podcast listeners may not be able to see this, but but Ian is he's remonstrating like an angry parent at a, at a parent's evening. <laughs> he's he's fighting for the future of 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 what education could look like. It, I my question then, Ian. I have millions, but my question is, how does tutoring? How does one to one or small group tutoring? facilitate that? Tutoring to me needs to, number one, be grounded in the idea that it's an invitation, that learning is an invitation, that it's not a top down, hey, this is what you need to know to survive in this world. And if you don't know it, you better watch out because you might not be as successful as you want to be or not survive at all. It's instead saying, hey, you have a place here at the table in this world and you're bringing something special to the table. So what I find is to really bring learners back is you have to find that kind of island of brilliance or that, you know, inside that student who that's still just something that just comes in immediately naturally and really kind of support that and build that out. Because I find that like plants kind of growing toward the sun, people grow toward affirmation. And if anything that can really give them a sense of like, wait, I'm special. It gives you the chance to stop judging yourself constantly worrying if I'm stacking up with everybody else or some expectation I have for myself that might be subconsciously adopted from my parents and actually focus on your development as a learner and, and in, engage with the uncomfortable without using it as a kind of an, a, another reason to beat yourself up. Um, and, and that's the biggest challenge most people face because most people are using, are really are kind of using the world as a source of affirmation and kind of like, and, and a way to be accepted rather than thinking of learning as a means of accepting the world. And just getting that shift is, is really grounded in unconditional acceptance of the student and an invitation, which to me really boils down to a question rather than a statement. And, and do you believe that what you're saying is is realistic do, do you genuinely believe that that is something that the education system can become um i think the the biggest challenge is ourselves and not any kind of logistical kind of reality uh, i find that people are in such survival states that they have the hardest time listening especially in the education industry. And to me, it's that kind of illustrates how stressed the system is. Um, it is, and, and and so like, when I come on and talk and say, hey, school is awful for smart kids. I'm, I really mean that, you know, but it's, it, and I'm trying to speak plain English and I'm willing to reconcile my perspective with people who are defensively you know, saying no school because I spent the past 30 years as a teacher. But it's like at a certain level, my experience of school is it's teachers and students reaching over kind of the constraints and structure of something that fundamentally doesn't work and, and doing amazing things anyway. And I'm I'm like I'm and I just invite any teacher to to participate in something where your brilliance as an instructor has a direct correlation with incredible impacts on the students that you work with. So it, it's, it's like kind of really a, a matter of persuasion. How can I speak to something that subconsciously people know and, and work around all those defenses 
that are keeping them surviving within the framework that they are so that they can let go of that. But it's, it's the same thing. It's a, it's a moment of learning, whether it's for the student on an individual level or it's all of the educators out there who have their own specific stance on things who are locked down in what they're doing. And, you know, what I, I call it the get to the glass of wine at the end of the day kind of mindset that I think a lot of teachers might be in. Yep. And, and might be in after this very conversation. and now a short word from last week's guest sandra pine hi there sandra here from jigsaw phonics tutoring and when i took part in the qualified tutor podcast i really learned that it's a great opportunity to be part of a wider community that has so much wisdom and experience on offer because it's always good just to have your tribe I really enjoyed Ludo's questions and the chance to talk about my area of interest, which is literacy, hopefully in a way that interests everybody listening. And to a future guest, I would say, just get your story out there. It has real power to spark something in somebody else. Now, I... Uh, we must be mindful of our listeners' ability to their 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 working memory, as it as it were. There's a lot uh, to think about there, and for any educator who has visions for uh, a better education system in the near, you know, far future, wherever it is, there there's a lot to contemplate there. Um, we've stayed we've stayed very high level thinking here, um, and I hope that our audience, our listeners, are. You know, are able to get to know you in a little bit more um, over the, the coming weeks and months, however um, you are able to, to, to be involved further. Um, so just before we bring this, this wonderful conversation in, uh, which I've enjoyed uh, very, very much to a close, I'd like to ask what's next for you? What's next for Ian Siegel? So I'm, I'm really motivated to kind of take what I'm saying to a broader audience to really start to change people's minds uh, on on a national level. I'm, I feel like I need to speak to parents and especially mothers about their responsibility in reimagining who we are as learners on a daily basis, because as we kind of create who we are with, you know, every new crop of humans that come up who are, who are born every day. And I think that starting there and starting because that's where I feel like we became learners as humans, really, it's through that mother child relationship um, that that we could really kind of rectify what we're doing now and reconcile it with kind of how we became incredible learners in the first place and, and, and really kind of come back to that path. So it's a high level journey, but and it's very challenging, but I'm very motivated to help. You know, I just feel like there's there's a tragedy in education right now, just in how how kids are spending their time, and and the, and the psychological impact that's happening. That's pretty devastating. So I want to kind of give especially bright kids the chance to be the best learners that they can again, and and take full advantage of life by spreading this message on a national level, if not international. So I'm glad to be in the UK here. Yeah, insert international into that. I don't think the new framework of the education system or the way that we work needs to be, uh, or even can be restricted by by national borders. So um, uh, welcome to the UK, Ian. Um, Thank you so much. You've given myself predominantly, but I assume many of those listening here uh, so many uh, visions for the future, so many avenues to explore in their own education uh, frameworks, in their own education lives. Um, and that's that's really the true power of a, of a great guest, Ian, so thank you. Um, of course, your next step, listeners, uh, after taking a moment to pause, is to head um, online and to grab uh, a copy of the tutor bible uh, of course uh, all major book retailers including amazon will, will, will sell it uh, and or you can head to ian-siegel s-i-e-g-e-l.com 
um, to, to, to find out more about the book. Uh, the, those links will be in the show notes. Ian, if they want to contact you directly, what's, what's, what's the best way to do that? Uh, email ian at streamlinelearning.com is perfect. Excellent. Um, Ian, we hope to be uh, bringing you into the conversation in our communities much, much more over the coming, uh, in the near future of the coming weeks and months, as I said. Um, it's, it's great to invite you onto the podcast. For the first time, I leave the door open uh, for a second or a third visit onto this podcast, if, if you so wish. But um, really, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed speaking about uh, what you do. I did, and absolutely would accept the invitation. So I appreciate it, Ludo. Okay. Cheerio then, Ian, and see you all next time. Bye. All right. Cheers. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Qualified Tutor Podcast. Whether you're a regular listener of this podcast or you've just stumbled across it, join the Qualified Tutor Podcast group within the Qualified Tutor community to stay up to date with our latest news, offers, workshops, and of course, simply to meet other tutors like you. Whatever your level as a tutor, our training courses will be the next step in your professional development. Visit qualifiedtutor.org slash training to find out more about our CPD accredited and Ofqual recognised courses, the first of their kind in the tutoring industry. Your student deserves the best tutor possible. Make that happen today by joining Qualified Tutor.